Hey Facebook Live Nation, hope everybody is doing well. Hope you're enjoying midweek service at 7 o'clock. Uh, glad to have each and every one of you with you uh, us today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to talk about uh, meeting some fears and doing some crazy things uh, against fear. We see that David and several other people uh, faced their fears. We called them giants. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, and you're turning there, I just want to want you to think about everything that's going on in the world today and realize that nothing caught God by surprise, that uh, He loves us, cares for us, and continues to uh, supply our need and is continuing to be in charge of all things. And uh, I hope you put your faith and trust in Him and allow Him to lead and guide and direct you to not live in fear, but to live by faith and walk by faith in all that we do. Um, we just came back from the store a few minutes ago, and there's a lot of people out there doing some crazy things, but uh, hopefully we're uh, okay. We're trusting the Lord in this. So in 1 Samuel chapter 17, I'm going to read the entire chapter. It's a lot of verses, 57 verses, and a lot of people are like, oh my goodness, I'm going to turn this off before then. But too many times we don't read the Bible enough, and so we're going to try to do so. Um, and uh, good to see some friends of mine online, some pastor friends of well. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, the Bible says, Now the Philistines gathered together uh, their armies together in battle and were gathered against Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Ezekiah in Ephes, Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and they drew in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and it weighed the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. And a shield bearer went before him. And then he stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that I'm that we may fight together. And when Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of an Ephratite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years, in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone and followed Saul in the battle. The names of these three sons who went into battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself forty days, morning and evening. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of dried grain, ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp. And carry the ten cheeses to the captains of their thousands, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, frightening, fighting with the Philistines. Excuse me. Verse number 20. And David rose early in the morning. He left his sheep with the keeper and took the things when uh, Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp of the army, was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. And then he came and talked with them. And there was a champion the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, 
Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to all the men who stood to him, saying, What shall be done to this man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered and said in this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, the oldest brother, heard when the men when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and your insolence of your heart, for you have come down here to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? And then he turned from him and toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail him because of him. Your servant will go up and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are unable to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by the beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he has defiled the armies of God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David in his armor and put his bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot even walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took it off. And then he took a staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and he put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch, which he had had. And a sling was in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near David, and the man who bare his shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you, and this day I will cause the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines and the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth will know that there's a God in Israel. And then all of this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword, for the battle is not the Lord's, and he will give you in his hands. And so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and took the Philistine and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistine as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And they wounded, and the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Shuram, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, put it and he put it, his armor, in his tent. When Saul saw that David was going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I do not know. So the king said, Inquire whose son this young man is. And then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with, his, with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David said, I am the son of the servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of the reading of your word. And God, we pray that you give us wisdom now as we study, as we look. God, as we hopefully stand in truth, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us. God, we want to pray for our country right now. We want to pray for our leadership. Pray, God, for our president and those who are around him, giving him advice that he'll make wise decisions. We pray for our Congress as they choose to make decisions that may impact our economy. Lord, I pray that we as believers would trust you and not trust the government for our provisions, Lord, and just seek you out in all things. Lord, your word tells us that if we seek first you and the kingdom of and your kingdom, God, that you will add all things or give all things to us that we need, Lord. And I just pray, God, that we would trust you with that. Father, I pray for those who are sick, those who are affected by this disease. God, I pray for healing. I pray that you be Jehovah Rapha, God, our healer, and that you bring about healing to them. Father, for those who who may be living in fear, God, we pray that they would come to know you and that they would have faith in Jesus Christ that would be everlasting and changing, Lord, that their their soul would not have to, to perish in hell because they have placed their faith and trust in Jesus, Lord, that you'll save them for all eternity. God, we just pray that uh, you'll help us as Christians, as believers, to stand tall in faith and to go just like David here as we face our giants every day in faith, Lord, trusting you because you've already won the battle. And Jesus, you won the victory on Calvary's cross when you went and rose up out of that grave three days later. And we thank you for victory that we have in you. Now I pray, Lord, that uh, you'll bless and honor the reading of your word. I pray, God, that you'll take the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart and make them acceptable to you, O oh God. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. So what's going on here? We've heard the story of David and Goliath many, many times, and we've watched and we've read and we've studied. The first thing I see right here, if you look in the very first verse, is there was an, an enemy invasion. The Bible says that, that here the Philistine army was in Soko, which is in Jerusalem, or in Jordan, excuse me. That was a lowland. Soko means lowland and brushy, shady and weak. And we see that the Israelites were in the Valley of Eli, which means uh, an oak forest, which means strong or fortress, something kind of different. The, the Philistines were in a shady, weak place. The Israelites were in a strong place because they were God's chosen people. Yet even in this situation, the Israelites were afraid. They were afraid because this guy, this giant, who was nine feet, nine inches tall, this superhuman being, super strength, his armor, just his armor that he weighed, he carried, weighed over 125 pounds. Uh, his sword was 17 pounds. I couldn't imagine picking up 17 pounds and trying to swing that around on a constant basis. He was just a, a big man. But even in that, he was a braggart. He was somebody who didn't believe in God and he tried to defy God. He tried to defy the armies of God, uh, the armies of Israel and everything else. He, he came out for 40 days, a unique number, 40 days and 40 nights, every morning and every evening. And he challenged Israel saying, send somebody out here to fight me. I'm, I'm the champion. I'm the go-between. I'm the person that's here. Send somebody out. And every time that he would do that, the Bible talked about Israel's armies in verse number 11. I don't think we need to forget this or miss this. But it says in verse number 11, it says, when Saul and all of Israel heard the words of the Philistine that they were dismayed and greatly afraid. If I'm not mistaken, some of us today are living in a dismayed and greatly afraid life. Dismayed means to be shattered or broken and confused. And there's a lot of confusion in the world today. There's a lot of people who live shattered lives. There's a lot of people who are broken. They're wondering when the next paycheck's going to come from. They're wondering if their job's still going to exist. They're wondering if their health is going to be there. They're wondering if their friends and family and parents are still going to survive throughout this coronavirus, this, this pandemic that's going on. And they're also greatly afraid, frightening the the word literally means shaking in their boots. It's sad to see where society is today, but when we place our faith in the things of this world, sometimes we can't stand without shaking because the things of this world always come to pass and they always bring about hurt and hardship. And so Goliath came out and he did this over and over and over and over. And Saul and his army sat there in fright day in and day out for 40 days. And finally, we see David come on the scene. We see an amazing thing happen. Jesse, he was wanting to check on his, his sons. He knew that he had three sons who were in battle. He hadn't heard from them. And he gave a command to his son. Jesse gave a command to his youngest son, David, I want you to take some food and some provisions out there, and I want you to bring back word how my sons are doing. Let me know what's going on. He was an old man, and he was concerned about the welfare of his children. The amazing thing that I see right here is that David did not hesitate. He listened to the command of his father, and he rose and he went. 
How many times are we commanded by God to do something? We study Scripture and it tells us this is something that we need to do. We pray and God puts somebody on our heart. We drive by a home and the Lord tells us to pull in. There's somebody in the grocery store line that we should be talking to. There's a friendly neighbor that we should wave our hand to and we just walk on by and God's given us instruction, commanding us to show and express love to these people. And we just walk on by. Here, David didn't do that. David said, okay, Dad, that's what you want. I'm going to follow your command. I'm going to be obedient to your command. And in doing so, he comes and he finds his brothers there. He finds them kind of scared. Uh, he finds them being defied by this Philistine, this godless man who, who was sitting there making fun of God and making fun of the armies of Israel. And uh, he's listening to all this and he turns and he makes kind of a unique statement. He, he makes a unique statement here. Uh, where he says, look, man, why? Why are you allowing this guy to, to defy um, the armies of Israel? Why are you allowing him to defy God in, in such a way? I think it's in verse number 26. It says, And David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man who kills the Philistine and takes away this reproach from in, uh, Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You got to realize that, that the Goliath was out there probably cursing, probably exalting the names of his gods, which were dead, which were man made, which were craven images, which didn't exist. But the God whom David served was a living God, was alive and well, and who was not to be defied. And yet so many times we don't take a stand for our God. We're like, we're like the, the Israelites here. We're in a strong forest that God has provided for us. We're His chosen people. But in all of this, we fear. In all of this, we kind of shake in our boots. In all this, we allow people to rise up and speak against God, speak against us, when we ought to be taking a stand. We ought to be unapologetically saying, look, my God is real, and I trust my God from here until I die. And when I die, it's better for me because I get heaven and I get to be in His presence. And so here's David. He's just with boldness and with faith. He, he's looking around and he can't understand why the armies are so afraid of a mere man. So afraid of a mere man. So many of us are afraid and live in fear of people, of circumstances, of situations. And here, uh, David hears of this bribe. Basically, King Saul says, man, if somebody will rise up and kill this Philistine, man, I'll make him a part of my family. I'll give him my daughter. I'll also uh, uh, take away taxes from his family. I'll make his family exempt from taxes. I don't know about you, but if somebody gave me the opportunity to be tax exempt for the rest of my life, I'd be standing up wanting to fight somebody. And so here's David taking a stand, not because of that. He doesn't want all that. He just wants to honor and glorify God with his life. And he realizes that God's bigger than this giant. God's bigger than everything that's going on. And so his, his, his own brother gets angry at him. His own brother looks at him and says, man, you just need to go home. Your arrogance has brought you here. Your insolence has brought you here. And David looked at him and said, no, you know the reason I'm here? I'm here because I'm being obedient to my father. And being in obedience to my Father, now I'm getting ready to be obedient to my Heavenly Father, the God whom I serve. While you're sitting there, brother, I love you, I respect you, but you're shaking in your boots. I came out here because Dad said to come and check on you. I'm being obedient to Him. I'm honoring my Father. But not only that, I'm getting ready to obey my Heavenly Father. I'm getting ready to take a stand for Him in all that I do. And I hope and pray that we could take a stand for the God who saved us. And so here they go. And, and Saul's excited because word gets to him and says to Saul, look, here's what I want you to do. If you want to go out and fight him, you can put on my armor and go fight him because you're just a young man. First, I don't think you can do it. We see that Saul doesn't have a whole lot of faith right here. Saul's missing a lot of faith. In, in verse number 34, it says, And then David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. He's, he's telling him about how qualified he is. But in verse 33, Saul says to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight a, uh, against him, for you're just a youth. This man has been a man of war since his, his youth. Goliath had been trained since he was a young guy. He's probably head and shoulders taller than everybody. He was in that 100 percentile of his growth range all of his life. He was of Anakin. Anakin was, uh, he was a descendant of Anakin. These were the people that Joshua went in and closed out and kept them from coming in to the promised land. We see that in Joshua chapter 11, verse 25, where Joshua went and fought and kept these people at bay. And he was a giant. He was a descendant of them. And here he comes and he's been trained from a, from a child. And, and David's just a young guy. And Saul looks at him and says, look, 
You're just a shepherd. There's no way. You're just a kid. You can't go and find him. And then David kind of shows him and lets him know, look, here's how qualified I am. I've killed a, a lion. I've killed a bear. I've been able to do those things. And this Philistine, this uncircumcised Philistine, this person who is not chosen by God, who's not a part of God's chosen people, he will be just like one of them, seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Do we have that kind of faith? Do we have the kind of faith that says, God, no matter what comes my way, I know that you're going to deliver me from it. Whether it's my poverty, God, I know you're my great provider. You promised to provide for me in Philippians 4.19. You tell me, that my God shall supply all of my need according to your riches by Christ Jesus. You promise that I can do all things through you who strengthen me in Philippians 4.13. You promise to always be there, to never leave me nor forsake me in Hebrews chapter 13.5. You promise to, to, to give me provision day and night. You promise me to not worry, to not fear that everything's going to be taken care of. And can we go to him and say, God, you are going to deliver me from the hand of this giant, whatever it may be whatever it may be. You see, sometimes we want God to deliver us in a certain way. I'm guilty, very guilty. I, I would love whenever I'm, I'm hurting, God, I want this pain to go away, whatever it may be. If it's the loss of a loved one, God, I want you to give me the ultimate comfort that I've never had before. If it's whenever maybe a relationship has been broken, God, I want you to mend this relationship that only you can mend. Um, you know, if it's a sickness or a disease, God, I want you to take this sickness away from me. I want you to take this disease away from me. God, I don't understand why these things happen, but I, I trust that you're going to deliver me. And here's the thing that we've got to realize as believers in Jesus Christ, that God will always deliver us. But sometimes the ultimate delivery is when he takes us home to be with him. And are we ready for that? And are the people that we love ready for us to be willing to go wherever God says, wherever God sends, and whenever our time's up, to be willing to go and be with Him forever, leaving our loved ones behind? You see, sometimes it's hard for us to say goodbye because we've never done that before. We've never died before. It's fearful. It's, it's something we've never done. But there's also an anticipation and excitement to know that all this pain's going to be gone, that we're going to be in heaven with, with Jesus forever. What an amazing thought. And we ought to be able to say, God, deliver me whatever way you want to, however you want to. And God, if you don't deliver me through this, I know that you're going to be with me through it. And you're going to strengthen me through it. And you're going to give me the, the ability to come out of this. And that's what David was saying. David was saying to Saul, look, the God who delivered me from the lion, the God who delivered me from the bear, that same God is going to deliver me from the hand of this Philistine, this giant, which stands before me right now. David had ultimate faith. He cried out in his faith. And so Saul tried to give him his armor, tried to tell him, put this armor on. It didn't fit. It didn't work. Now, now that's kind of crazy. Sometimes we stop and we think about armor and we think about these kinds of things. But, um, you know, I think God fits us, each one, individually for the battles that we're going to face. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 to put on the whole armor of God. And we need to put it on. It's, a, it's an armor that, that God has given to every believer, the helmet of salvation, a breastplate of righteousness, um, the sword of the Spirit, um, the feet of the gospel. There, there's you know all these things, the armor that we need. But the thing is, your battle is going to be different from my battle. Your giants are going to be different than my giants. And so my battle armor is not going to look like your battle armor. And here David was saying to Saul, look, I've not even tested your battle armor. This is great for you. You're a big man. I can't even move in this stuff. But I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, Saul. I'm going to go in the strength of the things that I'm comfortable with, in the, in the, in the armor that God has given me, in the armor that God has made me comfortable with. And he says, look, I'm going to go and I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my staff in verse number 40. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and he put them in his shepherd's bag, in his pouch, and he had a sling that was in his hand. Could you imagine going at a giant with a shepherd's staff and with five rocks and a slingshot? Why? Why did David take five rocks ever concern you ever matter the bible tells us in second samuel 21 22 it says these four were born to the giant in gath who was the giant in gath goliath and fell by the hand of david and by the hand of his servants you see david knew one stone was enough for goliath 
But he also knew that there was four others that needed to be taken down. And he went in faith and in the strength of God that God, I'm not only going to knock this giant down with you leading and with you fighting the battle, but the other four that may come at us. God, I've got a stone for each of them, trusting you to knock those giants out of my way. How much faith is that? What kind of, to go with a stick. That's even what Goliath said. Am I a dog that you come at we, with, me with sticks? In verse number 43, he said he cried out. The Philistine cried out and said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give you your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. You see, David went in the armor that God had provided him with and the armor that he was comfortable with to fight this giant right here and now. He knew that's all he would, he would need because he wasn't going to fight him with a stick. He wasn't going to fight him with a stone. He wasn't going to fight him with a, with a sling. He was going to be obedient to stand up for his God and he was going to allow God to fight the battle. And so many times, if we're just willing to step out of the boat, so to speak, when Peter saw Jesus walking on the water and he said, Lord, if it's you, if it's you, bid me to come. And Jesus said, come. And all he did is stepped out of the boat. And as soon as he stepped out of the boat, the Bible says that he walked on water. You see, he had faith as soon as he stepped out. And sometimes we just have to exercise that faith that God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to stand up for you. And whatever happens, I'm going in your strength. I'm going to allow you to fight the battle for me. And so, so David had a reply. The Philistine said, I'm going to give you the birds here. And David said, I'll wait just a second. He said, you come at we with a sword and a spear and a javelin. David was saying, look, you're coming at me with man-made stuff. You're coming at me in your strength. You're coming at me with your ability. I'm going to come at you with something that I've never had before, something that's bigger than me, something I've had all my life. Excuse me, it's what David's saying. He said, look, here's the way I'm going to come at you. He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day, I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword of the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. So many times we want to go and think it's all about what we do. Man, we've got a great plan. We've got everything covered, all the bases covered. We've got people to do this and people to do this, and we've thought everything through. But listen to me, when we go in our strength and we go with our plans and we don't place it into God's hand, most of the time it's a failure. But when we get out of the way and say, God, I'm trusting you. Yes, we've got people in place to make these things happen. But Lord, I realize that nothing happens unless you ordain it to happen. So God, I'm coming in your strength. I'm coming in the strength of the, of the Lord of hosts, of the Lord of the God of the believers in Jesus Christ, the Christian army the army of today, and that's who we are. We're a part of Christ's army, ready to fight and ready to move forward. And David went, and I love what happened here in verse number 48. Don't miss this. It says, and so it was when the Philistine arose that he drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. You see, here's what David decided to do. David said, you know what? There's my giant. There's my giant. Now here's, here's the thing that happens with us so many times. So many times when fear comes, then we take off running in the opposite direction. We want to run away from our fears. We want to run away from our giants. We want to tuck tail and get out of the way. Here's David. He sees his giant. And the Bible says that he hurried and he ran towards it. He ran towards it. Man, what, a, what an amazing picture of faith. I think about my old football days. And those of you who played football, you know that sometimes it's not fun getting hit. I was a wide receiver and quarterback and also played safety. Being a wide receiver, you come across the middle, you get hit. Sometimes you don't see the hit coming and it hurts. Uh, sometimes as a quarterback, you drop back to make a pass 
and your opposite side tackle hasn't done his job and you get blindsided from behind. The movie Blindsided talked about, or Blindsided talked about, you know, Michael Orr being that, that offensive tackle that guarded the quarterback's backside. And so many times that happens. We get blindsided and that hurts. I loved being a safety though. Why did I love being safety? Because I could initiate the contact. I could see the person I wanted to hit. I could run with all my might. I could prepare myself and I could give everything that I could to hit them head on and let them feel the brunt of the force, not me. I wasn't taking the punishment. I was going to dish it out. And that's exactly what David does right here in faith. He runs towards his giant and he says, look, I'm coming at you. You think you're coming at me, but I'm coming at you with all that I have in the power, in the strength, and in the might of the Lord God Almighty. And he picked out a stone and he threw it, sunk in the, in the giants. And the giant fell to his face. It sunk in his head, he fell to his face. And he took out the giant sword because he didn't have one. He said he was going to cut his head off. And you know what he did? He took his own sword out, the giants, and he cut his head off. And he carried it around. He had a trophy. It was the head of Goliath. He carried that trophy around for everybody to see. Look, I've got his head. He's no longer alive. He's no longer your champion. Victory was not mine. Victory was God Almighty. And he gave it to me this day. You see, we have victory. We have the ultimate victory in Jesus Christ. Those of us who are called Christians, who are believers in Jesus Christ, we have victory over death. We have victory over hell. We have victory over the grave. We have victory over our circumstances. We have victory over the lies of Satan. We have victory over the guilt that he tries to throw at us. We have victory not because of who we are, but because the finished work on Calvary's cross of Jesus Christ. We have victory forevermore, and we need to live in victory. There's a lost and dying world out there who's looking for hope. Hope. And they're looking for us as, as believers to live out our hope in all that we do. And so many times we fail to do so. So many times we, we live in fear and the world sees that. So, so I want to I wanna challenge you. I want to challenge you a couple things. First thing I want you to notice today is, is that David in his faith was willing to be obedient to his father and go out and feed his brothers. When we have faith in God, it may not make sense to go into battle to go see our brothers on the battle lines. But when we place our faith in God and we're willing to obediently follow Him wherever He says to go, amazing things can happen. He's going to put us in situations and circumstances where He can be glorified, where He will be exalted, where He will receive the glory and we will be a part of a great victory when we're willing to go out and be obedient. David was faithful to do his father's business. How faithful are we to do our father's business? David didn't face his fears in his own strength. He went in faith in the strength of the God Almighty Lord that, that he had served all of his life. You see, faith in the Lord will always result in victory in Jesus. Listen to me very carefully. This victory may not be an open victory like David had over Goliath. We may not see a giant fall, a proverbial giant fall. We may not see these amazing things happen. This victory could be that, that we experience a fixed marriage. It could be that we have a healthy body. It could be that, that, that God opened up a door for us to serve Him in a different area, that He provided for us in a way that we didn't think we were going to be provided for, that a relationship was mended, that a lost soul was saved. And ultimately, that victory could be that He ushers us in to His presence in heaven. Are we willing, are we obey, obedient enough to Him to say, Lord, whatever it is that you want me to do, I'm coming and I'm serving and I'm seeking you out. I want to follow you. I want the victory that you have for me. You see, the lost world looks at the cup always half empty. But the believers should look at the cup as overflowing. We should be drinking from our saucer because our cups overflow with the blessings of God. The Bible tells us in the Psalms that, that surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of the Lord, that, that my cup runneth over. God don't just give us enough to satisfy us. He gives us an, an measurement that blows our minds enough to keep us going forever and ever. Another thing I, I want you to see is that many people doubt. There's a lot of people that doubt. There's people that are going to come into your lives that doubt. We've got to realize that Satan, the father of lies, always creates doubt. But God is bigger than our doubt. Satan's a big giant, man. He's willing to come at us and cause us to question everything. But God is bigger than that. In 1 John 4, 4, the Bible says, Greater, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. We can trust that God, Jesus Christ, who's living inside of us through the Holy Spirit, is bigger than anything that Satan brings against us. Satan's going to cause us to doubt, but God's bigger than that. You see, faith doesn't look at the size of the problem. 
It relies on the enormity of God. Faith doesn't look at how big the situation is. Faith doesn't look at what we have and the circumstance that we're in. Faith looks and sees the outcome that's already happening. That's why Paul said, for me to live as Christ and die as gain. He said that when I believe Jesus Christ, I mean, my, my mansion is, is already built. Heaven's already there. It's so matter of fact. It's already taken care of. That's what faith is. Faith for us as a believer realizes that right now because we've placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our, our mansion's already been built. It's just a matter of time as when we're going to have that appointment with Jesus Christ to be able to spend eternity with Him. And we shouldn't fear. We should be excited. I mean, it's so matter of fact. Our lives are taken care of. Our soul is going to live forever in the presence of an Almighty God. Not because we're anything great, but because Jesus is everything. He paid the great price he took our sin debt upon Himself. He gave His life in exchange for mine. I don't understand it because, man, I'm a nasty, dirty, rotten person. And Jesus was perfect and pure in every way, but He was willing to give His life in exchange for me just so that I could be a vessel used from Him. And I'm so thankful and grateful that He went to Calvary's cross. And I'm here to tell you right now, if you're listening, if you're watching, and you don't know Jesus Christ, He loves you, and He gave His life. He exchanged it for you. If you'll be willing to just cry out, the Bible says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you'll just cry out, Lord, save me. I don't understand all this, but I know that I need a Savior. And Jesus, I need you to be Lord in my life. I give you my life. Will you forgive me? Will you cleanse me? Will you give me heaven? I promise you, He will. Because He can't lie, and that's what His Word says. So we need to think about one other thing. It's time for us to take the battle to Satan. We see here that David ran ran in the face of adversity. He ran toward the giant. He ran towards the enemy. It's time for us to take the battle to Satan. In the name of Jesus Christ, we have victory in Jesus. It's time for us to say to Satan, get behind me in the name of Jesus Christ. Leave me alone. I don't have time for you. There's a song out there, Devil Know Not Today. And we need to claim that. A lot of people may think it's a crazy song. I love the song because it's biblical that we can cry out, get behind me, Satan. As Jesus said that to one of his own who was trying to doubt his, his death and his burial and his resurrection. He's like, look, I ain't got time for that, Peter. Get behind me, Satan, because I know it's not you talking, but you're being used and being a pawn of Satan. And sometimes we just have to say, get behind me in the name of Jesus Christ. Leave me alone and listen to me, friend. Listen to me today. Listen to me very carefully. When we claim that promise in the name of Jesus Christ, Satan has to flee. He has to flee for that moment. He has to flee. That doesn't mean he's not going to come right back at us five minutes later, but he has to leave us alone right then and there because he has no victory. He has no power. He has no authority over the name of Jesus Christ. And we need to claim those promises so that we don't have to live in fear. We need to take the battle to Satan. The other thing is some of us today, I believe that all of us today, we have a giant that we're facing. There is a giant in our life. And that giant is sitting there making fun of us just like Goliath. It's calling us a wimp. It's calling us a, a dog. It's saying, why do you come? I mean, it, it's making fun of us. and Oh, you're just one of those Christians out there trying to live in faith. Yeah, we are. And it's time to face that giant. And it's time to say this. I'm not listening to your lies anymore. I'm not listening to your lies and I have victory over you, not in my strength, and I'm going to fight you, not in my strength, not with me, but here's what I'm going to do, giant. I'm going to cast you on my loving Savior. You see, 1 Peter 5, 7 tells us to cast our cares on Him because He cares for us. Too many of us are carrying around the weight of the world right now. Too many of us are carrying around these battles these enormous fears, these giants that are in our path, and we're trying to carry them around. And Jesus says, look, if you'll just give it to me, I'll deal with it. I'll deal with it. And some of us tonight, we just need to give our giants, we just need to give our cares to Jesus. We need to place them at the foot of the cross, and we need to leave them there. Too many times in my own personal life have I prayed, God, I'm giving this to you. And when I said amen, I reached around and I picked up those things back away from God and snatched them out of His hand. It's time for us as believers to give them to God and leave it with Him and allow Him to deal with it, allow Him to worry about it because He's not going to. He has victory over it and we need to trust Him in it. We need to trust the Lord. We need to trust His promises. We need to realize that He is a God who provides for our needs. He is the God who gives us health. He is the God who is our banner. He is our stronghold. He is our mighty tower. It's time to tell Satan to get behind us. 
And tell Satan also, look, I know what your future's like. Do you need to be reminded of it? You see, we have victory in Jesus Christ. And I hope and pray tonight that you realize there's giants that are going to come at us every day in a lot of different forms. Fear's real. The things that rise up against us are real. But we don't need to fear. We have no need to fear. Why? Because Jesus has taken that away from us. If we have Jesus Christ, we have all that we need. We have heaven. Maybe we don't have everything that we need in this world. Maybe people are going to make fun of us. Maybe we have to live by ourselves. Maybe we're frustrated from time to time because we feel like we're the only person out there living for the Lord. Trust me, Elijah thought the same thing. He just had an amazing slaughter on Mount Carmel where he was able to distinguish the Baal prophets. And he went and he hid in a, in a cave because some woman, the, the Queen Jezebel said, I don't want him. I'm going to kill him. And Elijah crawled up in a cave and the Lord said, Elijah, what's wrong with you? Why are you here? He said, because that queen's going to kill me. He just had an amazing victory. And he cried out to God. He said, God, I'm the only one left who has not, I'm the only one left who's not bowed down to Baal. And the Lord said, no, I've got 7,000 other servants who haven't. Trust me, you're not going through this battle alone. You're not going through this life with the, with the only fear that's out there, with the only giant that's facing you. And realize this, that you have Jesus Christ who's fought the battle. He won the war on Calvary's cross. When He rose up out of that grave, He claimed victory for me and you. And for all of humanity, who's willing to trust Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. So church, it's time for us to stand up. It's time for us to live out the profession that we claim, the confession that we claim. When we call ourselves a Christian, a child of God, it's time to live it. It's time to live it by faith, to have a smile on our face, to let the world know that I have Jesus Christ. I have victory. I have heaven one day. And then maybe church, we can actually tell people about why we're living the way that we are. They can look at our lives and they can see Jesus Christ and they can bring glory to Him. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 16, to let your light so shine before men that they would see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So I encourage you tonight, church. I encourage you to live by faith. I encourage you to trust Jesus. I encourage you to face your giants and run headlong into them, against them, not in your own power, not in your own strength, but in the strength and the power of Jesus Christ. Allow Him to, to fight and win that battle for you. We need to pray. We need to trust Him. We need to seek Him out in all things. And as we do that, we will have the victory that has been claimed by Jesus Christ. Now, maybe you're here and you're listening to me tonight and you don't have that faith. You have nothing but fear. You worry about everything. You don't know where you're going to spend eternity. Friend, I'm here to tell you tonight, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He loved you so much that He gave His life on Calvary's cross. He shed His blood so that He could pay for your sin debt. He willfully exchanged His life so that you could be set free from the curse of sin. So that you could have life forevermore. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And tonight, friend, you're living in fear. You're afraid. You don't know where you're going to spend eternity. Oh, you've heard of heaven. You've heard of hell, but you don't know where you're going to spend it. I invite you tonight to trust Jesus. I invite you tonight to cry out to Him and say, Jesus, I know that I need a Savior. I know that I need to be forgiven got sin in my life and I want to go to heaven will you come and be Lord in my life will you save me will you change me I believe you died on an Oregon cross I believe that you rose victorious on the third day, third day and I believe that right now you can save me and so I trust you I give you my life will you save me thank you for loving me Jesus thank you for saving me if you cry out to him the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, 13, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says if you've prayed that prayer, if you've asked Jesus in your heart, there's a party going on in heaven right now that we can't even comprehend. And if you've trusted Jesus, I encourage you to be a disciple. I encourage you to follow through. Find a Bible-believing church. You're always welcome at Moles Chapel Baptist Church. You can come serve with us. Uh, I also encourage you to find a place to be baptized. Say, look, man, I want to follow the Lord in obedience through believer's baptism. Find a pastor who will sit down and disciple you and nurture you. Friends, I love you. Church, I love you. I pray for you, and I pray that God will take this message and give us strength to live in these days of uncertainty. Here's the thing. 
Nothing caught God, God off guard. He knows all things. He's more than prepared to get us through coronavirus, to get us through financial troubles, to get us through whatever's bothering us right now. He's bigger than that. He's in control. So let's trust Him. Let's pray. Father, thank You. Thank You for being God. Thank You for Your sovereignty. Thank You for helping us be able to not only face our giants, but to run towards our giants by faith, knowing that You've already won the battle for us. Thank You, Lord, that we don't have to fight against the giants in our life and our own strength, that we can trust You, Jesus, and allow You to fight those battles for us. Thank you that you give us ultimate victory because you conquered death, hell, and the grave. Thank you for salvation, Jesus. God, I pray now, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless each person that's listening tonight. I pray that you give them faith. I pray that you give them courage. I pray that you give them strength. I pray, Father, for health. I pray for provisions. I pray, Lord, that, that, that everything that's necessary for life and for them to be able to survive in this life would be given to them. But most of all, God, I pray that their soul is right with you. Father, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us. Again, I pray for our nation. I pray for this world. Lord, I, I pray for those who have been impacted by this coronavirus worldwide with so many people's loss of life, so many families devastated. God, we know that, that it didn't take you by surprise, and we know that we all have an appointment with death. God, that's an appointment we're all going to make someday. And I pray, Lord, that we're ready to meet you not only we're we ready to meet you, but we're ready to spend eternity with you in heaven. Not because we're good people, not because we're, we're right in any way, shape, or form, but because we know Jesus Christ to be Lord in our life and you know us. Father, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us. We give you glory in advance of all that you've already done, Lord, and all that you're going to do. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Facebook Live, church, I love you. If you need me, uh, you're more than welcome to message me. I'd love to hear your comments. I'd love to talk with you. If you've got anything that, that needs uh, hashing out or just need somebody to talk to, uh, I'll listen. I'll try to give advice if you need it. If nothing else, I'll just be a loving person on the other end. I pray you have a blessed evening. We're going to do the same thing Sunday morning, but Sunday morning we're going to have a drive-in. It looks like the weather's going to be in the 70s. Uh, our praise band's going to be live. Last week we had about 40, 45 people showed up at church. We'd love for more to come. Uh, I've got enough sound. I think that we can probably handle a couple thousand. So if you want to come and you want to be a part, I'm also going to tell you if everything works out, I ordered individually wrapped communion wafers and individually wrapped uh, juice cups. And the plan is if they get here by Saturday and are here on Sunday, that we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper because we already had that plan and we want to honor God. We want to remember what Jesus has already done for us. So I invite you to come and be, a, be able to be a part of the, of the Lord's Supper. I'm hoping and praying that they come in today or sometime soon within the next couple of days so that we can celebrate together. Uh, again, hope to see you. If you've got a home church, go and be a part of it. But we'll be on Facebook Live again Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, and we invite you to come worship with us. Moles Chapel Baptist Church. It's at 9496 Jacob Fork River Road in Conley Springs, and the zip code's 28612. If you, if you need directions, let us know. Take care. God bless.